Thank you so much for joining us today. It's an honor to be sitting on this stage with you right now. And we're all sitting here partially because you wrote a book recently. Um, you're impressive and all, but like this book has a pretty cool cover. So I was wondering if you would be willing to tell us about why this book, why now? Um, it's titled Hate, Why Should We Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship. Do you have, do you have opinions you'd be willing to tell us about why this book now why particularly that title, and just a little bit more about your background in this. Thank you so much, Landon, and thank you, Fred, and everybody for this warm welcome. You notice I'm wearing your school colors. Uh, actually, I wear school colors whenever they look good on me, so thank you for having one in that category. Uh, and speaking of which, thank you for noticing the cover and the color of the book, because I think, you know that old saying that a picture is worth a thousand words? I think that the book jacket designer really captured my message um, very concisely. I was so, and continue to be so, concerned and consumed about that big, dark, frightening word of hate. I think it is spreading too much, not only in the United States uh, and even on college campuses, but around the world. And since Fred's nice introduction references my family background, I can just talk about the constantly pervasive anti-Semitism in addition to all other kinds of hatred uh, that are burgeoning, including on college campuses. A friend of mine just began graduate studies at Tufts, and just two days ago, there was a horrible anti-Semitic incident there of vandalism of the dormitory room of a Jewish student. Uh, in Germany itself, despite extremely strict anti-hate speech laws. There's just been a virulent rise in violent anti-Semitism and violence against Roma and refugees and immigrants, LGBTQ people. Uh, and I am so committed to doing what I can to counter that. I'm thrilled about the activism that we've seen on campuses all over the country against hatred of various sorts, but I've been dispirited that there seems to be, both through anecdotes and through surveys, uh, the view that freedom of speech is an enemy and that we should suppress hateful or hated speech in order to counter actual hatred and discrimination. And I've been convinced through the work I've done in human rights throughout my adult lifetime that far from being an enemy, robust freedom of speech is an essential ally that you cannot advocate for human rights for traditionally oppressed and marginalized and excluded individuals and groups unless speech is protected even for ideas that are deemed to be hateful and hated. You know, we may all be shocked by this, but in a lot of communities in this country to this day, the views of those who are advocating against discrimination for justice are suppressed as hate speech. And I can give you an example. Um, Black Lives Matter activists have been attacked not only for hate speech, but also accused of hate crimes. So I'm sorry, I could just go on and on, and I want to give you a chance to exercise your free speech. <laughs> well, thank you for bringing up the example, because I think it's important to keep things concrete, especially as we're talking here we feel very insulated often and schoolwork kind of takes up everything. So I think having concrete examples we can refer back to is really helpful. Um, and I was wondering in the spirit of concrete examples, if you would be willing to explain who you dedicated the book to and a little bit about the history of the ACLU and the Skokie scandal or controversy. I, thank you so much. I dedicated the book to a wonderful mentor, of two wonderful mentors of mine, Norman Dorson, who was my predecessor as ACLU president, and R.A. Nair, who was the executive director of the ACLU. And if I can say something, uh, this is a parenthetical, but speaking to such a talented 
young person and having had the, the privilege of speaking to such inspiring and with such inspiring students. Norman Dorson's daughter, who has been a mentee of mine, uh, became one of the MacArthur Genius Award winners yesterday. And I was so heartbroken that her parents were not able to see this. but. Um, they were the leaders of the ACLU at the time that we handled what is probably the most controversial case that the ACLU has ever been involved in, but is a landmark of U.S. law. It's a case that we won easily in the courts of law, but really had a struggle in the court of public opinion. It's usually called the Skokie case, referring to the fact that it arose in Skokie, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago, that, and it arose in 1977, at a time when Skokie not only had a large Jewish population, but Landon, given the timing, many of them were Holocaust survivors. For that reason, a group of neo-Nazis deliberately chose Skokie as a place where they wanted to have a demonstration. And the town of Skokie decided to st try to stop the demonstration. The ACLU came to the defense of their free speech rights because we have always heeded that uh, famous statement that is attributed to Voltaire. Apparently, he didn't say it himself, but he could have. Um, I despise what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. And that actually reflects what the Supreme Court has called the uh, bedrock principle of free speech jurisprudence. It's called viewpoint neutrality that government must remain neutral toward the viewpoint or idea or message of the speech, no matter how despised it is, that is not a justification for censoring it. And as the ACLU pointed out in our brief in that case, Landon, all of the ar arguments that were being made to suppress the Nazis from demonstrating in Skokie had been made uh, just a few years earlier in another town in Illinois with a very different population, namely Cicero, Illinois, highly segregated, deeply opposed to civil rights, and they wanted to keep out Martin Luther King's civil rights movement, and the ACLU cited the same viewpoint neutrality principles to protect their free speech rights. Wow. That's, a, that's an instance of, at least for me, I know a little bit about these cases and I know a little bit about law and how it's supposed to be completely neutral. Well, that is really, truly, like, neutral. <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, if I can give an example, since you, uh, met in the wonderful introduction, your trans activism was mentioned, uh, France, along with Germany, has some of the strictest anti-hate speech laws in the world that are very strictly enforced, and uh, the incidence of anti-Semitic violence and violence against other kinds of minority groups is very, very high in France. One example of somebody who was recently criminally convicted in France under the anti-hate speech laws is the head of an LGBTQ rights organization, and she was criminally arrested prosecuted, convicted, and sentenced for using the word homophobe to describe the head of an anti-gay rights organization. Uh, fortunately, she didn't receive a prison sentence, but uh, a very steep fine, which was you know, almost a bankrupting scale for a small organization of that sort. Um, and I could give many other examples. I know there have been some controversies on this campus recently about, you know, the debates about um, Israeli policies and Palestine. And in France, um, P Palestinian activists have regularly been prosecuted and convicted and sentenced for engaging in hate speech merely for advocating boycotts of Israel and put aside whether you think that's a, a positive strategy or a negative strategy, the right to advocate for a boycott is really a very important First Amendment and freedom of association type right. Yeah, that, that really is, and especially the speech aspect of it. Um, 
I realize that we are here for an event on free speech. So uh, that aside, the fact that someone was able to be um, sentenced for calling somebody a homophobe when that is something that we throw around in everyday conversation when we're talking about debates over ideology. The fact that somebody be sentenced over that is surprising. Well, the exam so my book gives a lot of examples, and I, I do think, despite having uh, come at this topic with a lot of experience that convinced me that freedom of speech, even uh, f uh, to say things that other people consider hateful, to me is just absolutely essential to uh, oppose to, to seek reform, to oppose discrimination, to advocate on behalf of those who have traditionally been excluded. To the best of my human ability, I did approach this with an open mind. Uh, I looked at all of the evidence that had accumulated since the last time I had studied the subject, namely the actual enforcement experience of countries around the world. The United States is exceptional. Countries around the world, including comparable democracies, do allow government to punish ideas and expression solely because their viewpoint is hated. And in my book, I quote human rights activists from these countries around the world, because I don't at all want to come across as a carpet-bagging American. What I thought was so interesting was the human rights activists in Germany and Canada and Australia and the U.S. UK and all of these other countries were saying, we ought to move more in the direction of the United States, not because of any concerns about free speech. Their own country's laws obviously do allow hateful speech to be censored, but because they said, regardless of the positive purpose of these laws, in effect, they have at best been ineffective and at worst, they've been counterproductive. Just last week, I did a debate in the UK uh, for an international group of, of lawyers, and uh, the person I was debating against who was supposed to be defending censorship of hate speech, he was a British professor, said, you know, I agree with Nadine. I think these laws are doing more harm than good. But he wanted to defend, he was a philosopher, and he wanted to defend the law uh, for a philosophical or symbolic reason, but he did acknowledge that it was disproportionately um, the very members of the minority groups that were hoped to be protected were the ones that were disproportionately being censored. And think about it, you know, that is not a coincidence. The concept of hate, that's an emotion. It's inherently subjective. What one person considers hateful speech is somebody else's cherished loving speech. And I give many, many examples of that. Well, you know, we were talking about uh, Christianity over dinner. You won't be surprised that in these European countries, a lot of Christian ministers, including Protestants and Catholics and some Muslim imams, have been criminally convicted under hate speech laws for preaching from the Bible or the Quran. And we, be, we understand why certain passages might be seen as hateful or discriminatory on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity or, uh, or gender for that matter. Uh, and yet, I have no doubt that these people were motivated by love, right? They're trying to redeem souls. And uh, to have them treated as criminals and, and thrown into prison is, um, I don't think it's the most effective way to try to change somebody's attitudes on those issues, among other problems. That's, um, that's fair. There's, there's something to be said about somebody digging in once they see uh, opposition. And to follow up on that, I want to bring it back to Williams, and I want to talk a little bit more about viewpoint neutrality, just very quickly. Um, and the idea of speech as a form of violence and hate speech not being free speech. So those two things with viewpoint neutrality as it relates to small campuses like ours. Well, first of all, just as a, putting on my constitutional law professor hat, here's a point that uh, many people don't know, which is that the constitutional free speech guarantee does not bind private sector entities. So Williams, as a private educational institution, has absolutely no constitutional duty 
to respect free speech rights on the part of students or faculty members. That's the bad news. Uh, the good news is that there are other legal uh, constraints that do commit Williams as a matter of contract, right? It undertakes in the various documents and commitments that it makes when it recruits students and faculty members to voluntarily respect fundamental free speech and academic freedom principles as consistent with its educational mission. But it could change that. I mean, Williams could decide that we want to create a different kind of community here, one that is not going to have such a robust protection of free speech. And my argument in the book really is not rooted just in legal technicalities. As it happens, I'm convinced that First Amendment free speech law does the best possible job of promoting not only individual liberty and freedom of thought and expression, but also all of the goals that are uh, asserted by those who advocate censorship, because I truly am completely committed to those goals. Equality, dignity, diversity, inclusivity, societal harmony, mental well-being and physical well-being on the part of individuals. I'm absolutely committed to those goals and I absolutely am convinced that censorship solely on the basis of a hated message is going to do more harm than good. But since you raised the question, Landon, it's really important to know that our free speech law in this country, as well as under international human rights law, does allow government and a university that, or a, a college that wants to adhere to these standards to punish speech, not just or solely because of hating its message or its message being hateful, but if in a particular context that speech directly causes certain serious, imminent, specific harm, such as constituting a what lawyers call a true threat, where the speaker intends to instill a reasonable fear on the part of the person or persons to whom the speech is targeted that they're going to be subject to attack, or intentional incitement of imminent violence, or targeted bullying or harassment. So when the speech does uh, cause or imminently threaten harm, it is already subject to punishment. If I could give one other example, often um, hateful expression arises in the context of what's called a hate crime or a bias crime. And this is you know, something that is independently punishable, uh, independent of any idea that it reflects because it's vandalism causing harm to property or assault causing harm to a person. When the victim of that crime is singled out based on discrimination, you know, we're committing vandalism against a mosque or against a synagogue, or we're committing an assault against a trans person, uh, the law can and does treat that as a more serious crime, recognizing it does more harm to the individual, to the group to which the individual belongs, and to society as a whole. And usually the way to prove the discriminatory selection of the victim is through expression. So we should not underestimate the extent to which hateful speech can when it does cause that kind of harm and actual violence is already punishable. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, that's incredibly enlightening and I think a good foundation to move forward because Williams as a community and as an institution, as you know, has been really trying to navigate questions of free speech. And last year, members of the Williams faculty um, released a petition endorsing the Chicago principles of free speech. This was met with significant student criticism for various reasons and actually led to the formation of the ad hoc committee. At this point, I would like to invite up our panelists and have them join us for the rest of this conversation.
Thank you, everybody. Jana, would you be willing to give a brief background quickly on the reports and just what's been happening on campus? Yeah, I mean, I thought it, uh, I, the report is 30 pages long, um, but I think I can say a couple of things about it that will be informative, and I actually have a little spiel I want to, um, to run on freedom. So I'm a philosopher, and I think that it's a, it's a complicated concept. There are a lot of definitions of it. Uh, and I think it's relevant, so I just, that's why I want to do it. But our task was to, it was very narrow, actually. Our, our, our charge was to develop guidelines for speaker policy. But um, in the president's charge, she also uh, raised a series of questions about classrooms, about what the purpose, how do, you know, what the purpose of an education is, what our values are. Um, and so while the charge was narrow, the, the, a series of questions that she asked us to think about in the process of engaging in the project that we had, 13 of us, was, and she, she asked us to please come up with a consensus, so this was a fairly challenging task, um, was, um, was broader. And it's clear that speech is the tip of the iceberg, um, that the classroom dynamics, the, class, the climate on campus, the sense in which there may be discomfort, um, sharing points of view among students, partly for, because of backlash or what's called call-out culture and so forth. These were all in the background of our thinking. Um, we did a lot of outreach. The report uh, describes that in detail. You get to hear some of the, the qualitative data that we have. It's all available. And what we concluded in our guidelines, what our guidelines amounted to was uh, um, operated with uh, a concept that we borrowed from someone who's in the audience now, Sigal Ben Porath, who I've also happened to be visiting today and consulting with different members of the campus community, um, the notion of inclusive freedom. And so we eventually uh, had most of our committee members on board with the idea of trying to talk about the way in which um, inclusivity and free expression are not, um, are mutually reinforcing, potentially. Well, what notion of freedom would that be? And this is an educational institution. Um, we came up with guidelines, some policy tweaks, and uh, other um, suggestions. The, the executive summary is quite short, it's two pages. Anybody can go on the internet and find it. Um, and if you have any questions about it, I'm happy to ask, but uh, to answer them. But, what I want to say about freedom, and, and, and especially in the context of an educational institution, whether even if it's a private one, is that there are different conceptions um, that are associated with, you know, we can go back beyond this point, but if we think about this 20th century uh, political uh, thinker, Isaiah Berlin, and his two concepts of liberty, he talks about negative and positive freedom. Negative freedom is libertarian freedom. It's being free from any obstacles to do whatever you might want. It's, 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 there's nothing impeding your ability to do what you want to do, to say what you want to say in the case of speech, um, except maybe some restrictions that have to do with harm. That could be um, a, a basis of it. But positive freedom, which I think is a much, uh, it's a much more robust concept, it, in an educational institution where we're talking about developing um, students' um, capacities in certain ways makes sense, right? So I think we can value positive freedom, which includes things like the ability to realize yourself, to express yourself, to learn to express yourself effectively, um, realize your potential, and, um, and have a capacity to affect something, to make something happen, to feel empowered in some way. And I think those are things that can come, and I believe deeply, from a liberal arts education. That those are the goals. Critical thinking, dialogue, discussion, disagreement, um, and as a, as a part of a learning process that actually empowers people who are, empowers students, and that's the aim. And I don't see how that can happen if we don't learn how and see modeled responding to things that we hate with, I might say, not just more, but better speech. And the, the goal here is to produce better speech over time, in your time here. And um, 
And so I, while I wouldn't necessarily want a, a, a national positive freedom agenda in the sense that um, it could become a little draconian, I think at an educational institution it makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Jenna. So Essence, Hamza, I have the first question for you guys actually is, would you be willing to tell us a little bit about what it's like to be a student here? Because I am also, but I think our experiences are very different because I do live off campus. And I really would like to know your thoughts around campus climate and the sense of inclusion and the conditions that make speaking or feeling included difficult. Um, so, personally, I think that people censor themselves in terms of what they feel comfortable saying. And I think it is a broader trend on campus that people that we disagree with, we automatically almost dehumanize them and don't try to understand where they're coming from. We assume worst intentions, even when someone may just misspeak or maybe they simply think that. And I think it has caused students to not be truly honest in classroom discussion, not be honest with each other, and it's almost superficial in terms of any complicated subjects, and even things that we would assume we all have the same opinions about, and which we all don't have the same opinions about, like race and gender, have become superficial because we're scared that if we say something even remotely wrong, then you'll be labeled as something that you're necessarily not. Yeah, um, to add on to that, I. And I, I think you guys will hear um, throughout the night that my, my main focus is on empathetic discourse. Um, I, I tend to put the emphasis on the students um, in terms of resolving the free speech issue on campus. I do think as a student, and this partially comes with just being a college student, but it's especially prevalent at Williams College, um, we fall into these elective affinities, right? And um, it's because it's a small school, we tend to inhabit um, the same spheres. But what happens is, despite this being an incredibly ideologically diverse college, uh, we, we fall into these uh, fairly isolated stratas. And you, like, you can see it everywhere you look. You can see it in Mission Dining Hall. Um, people aren't actually talking to each other, which is interesting because it, it really comes, um, it starts to clash with like, what the goal of a liberal arts education is uh, to, to dismantle um, what Kant would call an immature perspective on the world and broaden your horizons on what, like what knowledge and the pursuit of learning can look like. So I do think that despite everyone at, the, that, everyone at the college being incredibly intelligent, incredibly willing to learn, not much is done on the part of the student. Well, I don't want to say not much is done on the part of the students. More could be done on the part of the students to engage with perspectives that make one truly uncomfortable. Well, thank you. That sounds, if I'm interpreting you correctly, both of you, it's just, it seems that there's a willingness to talk about things that are easy to talk about and that are commonly agreed upon, but when it comes down to having like a truly heated debate in the middle of class or reaching out to somebody that you actually probably disagree with fundamentally, it's easier to just not do that completely. Is that, am I interpreting you correctly? Well, thank you. Um, that leads actually perfectly into the next question, which is I was wondering, there is, we have a, I'm trying to think of the best way to phrase this, because we have a really dedicated desire here to be inclusive, and we have a commitment to inclusion, but we also are an educational institution. And those two things seem to conflict often and very boldly. Like, when, when those conflict, it, it, it erupts. And so I was wondering if the panel, Nadine, if you guys would be willing to talk about the ways that those can conflict, especially in a small community like Williams, and the ways we can work through those consequences. I really am so supportive and enthusiastic about Sagal Ben Parat's book and leadership on this issue and the wonderful work that was done by Jana's committee uh, because I, and, and my book is on the same theme that I think we cannot have true freedom without equality and vice versa, that they are absolutely mutually reinforcing. And especially when you have this robust concept of a meaningful free speech, it has to be inclusive, inclusive of everybody regardless of who you are, anything about your identity, 
but also regardless of what you believe. And I love your concept, Hamza, of empathetic listening. I recently saw somebody who had a similar phrase, they called it eloquent listening, right? Where you, um, and there are strategies that can be taught to do this. Um, so I'm sure, so for example, you say something that hypothetically I disagree with, I start by making sure I have understood what you said by paraphrasing it back. And that's my beginning at empathizing. And I can say, even somebody like Pat Buchanan, and it was fun to defeat him in debate, but using that as an example, you can still, and I've debated people with whom I strongly disagree on civil liberties issues, but you can always find some point of agreement if you dig down deep enough. And I think that is really important, uh, partly because you may actually change that person's mind a bit. You may enhance your own understanding a bit, but at the very least, you're stretching your mind. You're hopefully finding some point where you can collaborate uh, for mutual benefit, and, but I, it doesn't come naturally. We have to make efforts to do it, and I gather that effort is going on on this campus. If any of you would like to respond or tack on to that, please feel free. I mean, one thing I, I think is important to say is that, you know, the college is committed to inclusion and it's a process. I think that as students are, um, are bec making the, making um, administrators and faculty aware of the ways in which some of them feel um, less included. And um, it's a difficult, we're in a difficult national scene. Um, Students, depending on their background, are um, also feeling, uh, in some of them feeling uh, assailed generally. And so to come here and not have it be feeling as comfortable and safe as they had anticipated while they're trying to, they're working very hard to finish their work here, um, understandably are upset when they feel harmed by things that are going on on campus. Um, one of the things that um, Sigal Ben Porth said today uh, in a conversation that I was a part of was that we have to, um, one of the costs that we pay for free expression is that, is enduring certain harms. And, and many people feel harmed, whether it's intellectual harm. Dignitary harm is a harder one to feel dehumanized. Uh, by someone's speech, but I, and I think in those conditions, one of the in situations that one of the aims of the committee was to take those that kind of harm seriously as part of our institution, and to continue to work to mitigate that harm, to continue to work to address it uh, in ways that don't require censorship, but that require um, the work involved in empowering students and making them feel safe and reminding them that they were accepted and they are included. They're in a pluralistic group. We are a community in some way, but we are also many different people from very many different backgrounds with different beliefs and different experiences. It's an opportunity, I agree, to understand one another and to learn from one another and to disagree. And it should be done respectfully. It should be when it can be. And I understand that emotions can run high. Um, but there are ways to also learn how to um, regulate those emotions in order to continue to be a part of um, a conversation, a group, uh, to establish connections and relationships, which is one of the advantages of being here. So Justice Brandeis gave us a dictum in response to how to treat hate speech. And he said that the remedy is more speech. And you're saying that we need to learn how to debate and to communicate and to truly listen to each other and find points of commonality. What burden does that place on the different members of our community and how do we ease the burden for those most marginalized who are already doing so much more work to be here or to prove their existence? Do, the student, do students have ideas of things that would improve their sense of 
belonging, inclusion, safety at Williams? I mean, yeah. I, think I, actually, I think we should be asking the students yeah, to help yeah. us. Not that we can't work on it too, but. Yeah, and hopefully, um, hopefully we get more questions about this specifically from the audience. Um, for contextualization, uh, the op-ed that I written last year, it was specifically on uh, the Chicago Statement and the implications of its application, or rather the, the social implications of its application um, to the Williams College Society as existing. Um, and what occurred to me actually, and sorry that I'm going to go off on like a tiny bit of a tangent here, but what occurred to me is when I published the op-ed, um, my points immediately got co-opted by either side. Uh, the far right had immediately jumped on me and characterized me as a hyper-liberal snowflake who uh, didn't actually know how free speech worked. And the far left actually uh, jumped upon my claims and argued that the platforms of the far right should be shut down um, because they're damaging to marginalized populations on campus. The point I was actually trying to make is I do believe in viewpoint neutrality. And the first sentence of my op-ed is I believe in free speech, which was hotly contested in the internet comments. But what happens on a campus where people aren't talking to each other? Um, how should I phrase this? Right, so we have, we have these elective affinities that aren't talking to each other. Uh, applying the Chicago Statement is amazing in theory until you consider the fact that it presents another possible avenue for students in a dominant positionality to protect a possessive investment in whiteness and pursue topics that they want more knowledge upon without actually having to engage with people that they go to school with every day regarding the issue. And like a common, a common complaint I hear is, there also, there is just like a general assumption of ma uh, malice on both sides. Um, and that is actually why I, I hesitate to use the term comfort college because I, I think that people should feel comfortable on a college campus. But I also think that using it in the way it's been used is a little infantilizing because the students here are grown adults who are willing to expand their mindsets in order to learn. And I, I truly believe that after the conversation that I've had, and I also, I just exist like in a lot of different um, spheres on campus, which has helped in having these conversations, uh, that people are, are willing to challenge their beliefs. It's not an issue of people wanting to protect their comfort at all costs. But what happens is people in a dominant positionality enjoy a higher baseline of comfort, right? So when applying the Chicago Statement, um, yes, it works in theory. I truly believe that speakers should be invited to campus to contest. But in the case of like the New York progressive or hyper-liberal white student who invites these speakers to campus with no malice, not, not necessarily to agree with the pseudo-intellectual or openly racist remark that the invited speaker truly believes in, um, but rather to, to argue and develop counter-arguments toward those points. That can happen in the classroom. Um, I, I take issue with, with providing um, financial gain towards these professors when people that we go to school with every day um, suffer through these things and are willing to talk about it. And that brings me to another counter argument that is a fair counter argument um, because of the assumed malice. Something that comes up um, with what, what I'll call a New York progressive to make it easier um, is that marginalized students don't feel comfortable doing the role of educating um, those occupying dominant personalities, right? Which is fair, because we, we are here as students and we don't have to do the labor of educating these other students for the sake of the college. We're here to learn too. And my point to that is always why, what is your purpose in talking to these marginalized students, right? Because you can treat them as educational dioramas. Um, you can engage them in the perspective very briefly if you so choose but you're still protecting that investment. You're not actually engaging with their perspective. You're hearing about the things they have gone through, but you're not, you're not connecting on a human level. It's not empathetic discourse. So are you really challenging your beliefs or are you just briefly coming into contact with another challenging belief before coming away unaffected? Um, sorry, I just went off on a really long tangent, but yeah, so like that, I think that, that was the point of my op-ed. Um, what was the original question? I will pose it. <laughs> it was a great answer. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what burden does more speech and counter speech place on different members of the community and how do people re reduce that burden for marginalized identities? Right, um, so my, my comment about occupying a bunch of different spheres on campus, um, I'm a first gen low income student, I'm a racially mixed man on campus, I'm a heteronormative student athlete on campus. Um, and having all these conversations 
what has occurred to me, I'll, I'll use um, the student at Louis White, for example. I, a lot of my teammates are in the audience uh, right now who have come out to see me. That's amazing. They wouldn't know me um, if I hadn't taken up running as a sport in high school. Um, and I'd had this conversation as a freshman after everything that had gone on uh, last semester, which many of you are familiar with. I was having a conversation as a freshman with a bunch of upperclassmen who had never really spoken to me prior. Um, they were asking about everything that had going on and asking each other, um, specifically about professors leaving, specifically about demonstrations on campus. And so I spoke up and said that like, I, I could chime in and I knew a little bit about it. And it turned into me talking to these 10 upperclassmen who I'd never spoken to before, going back and forth, not debating. Uh, it, it was a, and it was genuine empathetic discourse. Like they were engaging with me on this. Um, they wanted to learn more. They wanted to understand what was happening. And yet when it came down to what they could do next, they asked me like, oh, like, we know that we, we occupy this privileged position. Like we would want to do more. We'd want to learn. We'd want to have empathetic discourse. How do we do that? And the response that I'd given was, well, I'd been on campus for four months. I was a freshman. I wasn't even 18 yet. Um, I had come into contact with everything that was going on, been very rapidly educated as a first-gen student on like, what it meant to exist at a place like this. Um, and then I'd been turned into the spokesperson to explain to these students who had been there for like three years um, already and had never spoken to anyone else on the campus about it. And that was the point I'd made to them. Um, they only knew me because I was a runner. Um, I think, and I, I am repeating myself at this point, more, more work could be done on the part of the student in actively engaging um, with the person who is sitting across from you as opposed to um, sampling a point of view briefly. So yes, it's, it's completely valid that marginalized students don't feel they have to educate, but everyone here is a student with a voracious appetite for learning who wants to engage, but it's just not happening right now. And yeah, and well, that was the point of my op-ed at the very least. I'm sorry that I just talked for like five or 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, adding to that, I think, I think it's a hard truth to admit that marginalized communities are always the ones that have to be burdened with the task of, or the burden of free speech. But I also think it's a disservice to say that we just shouldn't educate people or we just shouldn't engage with it. And I think it easily turns into when someone says something that we don't like or someone says something that is misguided and rooted in ignorance to say, they're, to disregard them as a human being and say they're just clueless and disregard them. Because in reality, we're minimizing their social and political power. Like, they vote for policies that are based in their ignorance. And if you're just gonna not challenge that, and you have the prime position to do that, I also think that's a greater disservice to marginalized communities, especially when we do have the privilege of going to a place like Williams. It's not enough just to be smart in a bunch of things. Like, we know climate change is real, we know populism is real, and yet we vote nationalists into office. We don't believe in climate change. And knowing enough, knowing stuff isn't enough. We have to communicate messages, and we have to understand people that have misguided beliefs isn't enough anymore and that's a sad thing to say but it needs to be said and I think that we have an obligation to engage with it. When we see and, it. and speaking of obligation I think it's the responsibility of every single member of a community to speak up against hatred, against stereotyping, against discrimination. It's especially important that that kind of message comes from the leaders um, so political leaders, campus leaders, the university college president. Uh, and I want to say what I really learned about the one type of, I use the term counter speech to mean any use we make of our privilege and power and right of free speech to try to make a difference in reducing hatred and ignorance. And it can take an infinite number of forms as an advocate I usually do it by debating ideas, such as explaining to Pat Buchanan that non-citizens have uh, fundamental rights. But in the research I've been doing for my book and afterwards, I've become incredibly moved by a very different kind of counter speech of really generous people, both online and offline, engaging in protracted one-on-one -on -one 
dialogues with people who believe hateful ideas and are even leaders of hate monger organizations. There are such inspiring stories where they have been weaned away and you can't do it frontally. You don't combat, you know, count, say you're wrong. Uh, you have to develop an empathetic bonding relationship with them and they develop a trust in you and then gradually they start uh, as there's one um, African-American blues musician named Daryl Davis who's been doing this for several decades. He's written a book about it. He's got TED Talks and um, he has actually recruited 200 former KKK members away using the bond of music. He's got a collection of their robes and he said, I, people thank me for having converted them. He said, I didn't convert them. I reached out to them and they converted themselves. Wow, so the, the strategy you're talking about is actually one we use in transmilitary work a lot because when you're trying to justify your existence to somebody, you first change your heart and then they change their own minds. So thank you for that. Um, I want us to take a step away though from the one-on-one -on -one conversations and to the idea of platforming and campus speakers. So the argument has been made that colleges, by providing a platform, confer legitimacy to speakers and they give financial benefits. So given this, there seems to be a value for colleges to adopt policies which recognize the importance of their platform and use the symbolic value of no platforming, hate speech, um, certain speakers who would cause dissent on campus or have hateful opinions. Please discuss. <laughs> um. I guess I just want to start with two things. One, I think it's wrong to deny the fact that these people already have a platform and they're using it very effectively and better than us, I would say. Um, and I think that saying that because they went to Williams, we're giving them a platform, I would say that they've built that platform themselves. And speech, and ideas are one thing and writing is one thing, but speech is how you build your base and how you connect with people on a personal level. And I think that it's a real value for us to see that interaction of how people build a base. How do speakers turn ideas and get people to join whatever cause they're talking about and to actually see that visceral exchange of ideas. And I think that by inviting them here, it's more than just reading their papers, but it's more like seeing them as a person and then taking those skills, even if we don't agree in anything that they're saying, but understand the people that they've connected with and understanding how they did it so that we can do it better and that we can convince people of the ideas of all, all the things that we're learning here. You actually are reminding me of, I was in a class a couple of years ago where the faculty member assigned us op-eds to write and we actually read the op-ed of a speaker who was coming to campus who they were debating whether or not to disinvite him. There was some stuff around his invite, invitation. And we, my group in that class, spent the entire week just dissecting and studying his form of arguments because he was coming to speak, so you should know what traps he's going to lay or where you disagree. Um, do you see a potential for, like, because we took that upon ourselves, we thought that would be a fun project and called it our homework, and do you see, like, potential for that as well? Yeah. And I think by doing that, it takes the burden off of marginalized people because anyone, anyone that goes to Williams can take look at an argument and look at the logical fallacies in it. And I think that it's useful recognizing that it's not even just the idea that's important, but it's how the idea is conveyed and how they've chosen to do that. And it's a skill that's very difficult. And it, I think it's useful to start learning those things. Cool. Hamza? <laughs> so what comes to mind for me, um, and I'm aware, I think, that the two views that I have um, so far posited um, seem contradicting at first, right? Because I'm arguing, I'm arguing for viewpoint neutrality. Um, I'm arguing for the ideals behind the Chicago Statement, and yet I am incredibly cautious in going forth with its application in a place like Williams College. And I think what it comes down to, um, I used a phrase before, um, providing an avenue for protecting a possessive investment in whiteness. Um, and I, I'll trade whiteness for dominant positionality um, if it's more all-encompassing. <laughs> it, 
it just seems to me that there could be, we could be doing more as a student body. Um, and I, I keep reiterating that the impetus is on the student body, but it's because um, Professor Sawicki mentioned that institutions take a long time to change. So I think that the opportunity to have a platform uh, is a very uh, important and finite opportunity, right? Every campus has only a limited amount of time and resources and space and attention, and I think uh, it's a very important educational opportunity, and I think that the campus should be strategic and intentional about how it is using that opportunity. That does not at all mean not inviting people with whom you deeply disagree, uh, but doing a lot of planning and thinking in advance, what is the educational purpose of that invitation? How is it going to help all of our students, including those who are uh, marginalized and dehumanized by this, in a worst case scenario, by the speaker's view? How can we use it? How can we turn it around, as Essence says, to help the students, and as you say also, uh, to help them to develop the arguments and the strategies to, if not change that person's mind, at, use, you, at least use it as a foil to persuade other people and to um, gain support from other members members of, of the campus. And I think that um, having advanced discussion and transparency um, in every situation, those who disagree with the speaker's ideas may have different strategies about how best to exercise counter speech. Experts, including the Southern Poverty Law Center and the Anti-Defamation League, say sometimes the best strategy is to ignore the speaker. It may feel very morally satisfying to engage, but you may unwittingly be amplifying the message and increasing support. So I think in each case, you have to make a very considered, deliberate judgment. I mean, I should add that, because this is relevant to the, um, the guidelines that we drafted, that one of our goals was to give more advance war for, for the system to be such that um, you will have more advance warning, there will be a central calendar, this, the talks go up on those, um, you know who's sponsoring, who's, owners, who's taking ownership of the event, um, they have to think about what the educational value of the event is, and um, we have information as a community if we want, we want it, and word about an event could can spread if it's one that um, people are, dis are concerned about in one form or another. That gives us an opportunity to do things that might be preparing for counter speech or for ignoring, for not showing up, um, or, or for some sort of, yeah, some sort of protest or statement, or another event, a counter event. But so we were trying to build in the possibility of those sorts of possi of those kinds of moves, and the college is committed to providing, if where desired, support for the counter-programming uh, if you choose as a group to say, we would like to have somebody else speaking at the same time. The other thing we suggested is different formats. Mm -hmm. Don't just have someone, give them the platform and have them speak out to the audience, but instead have them engaging with people from the community or with another speaker. So those are, and if you have time, you can sometimes build that in. Uh, so it's good. I'm yes. glad you brought up the different formats because one thing that I want to close on before we move to the question and answer is a question about the value of free speech at an institution like Williams. And I want us to take in mind things like different formats, the way that free speech can be chilled, cancel culture, and I want to address those as it pertains to the importance of an education and the importance of free speech, and then see where we can move forward from there. And then we'll move to question and answer, I promise. I would say that the purpose of a Williams education, I take it to mean a more broad definition of what that means. And for me, everyone that graduates here it has a responsibility to be leaders in their community, change makers, in their workplaces, societies, wherever they exist after here. And 
I honestly think that it's a disservice if you spend your whole time here only hearing ideas that you agree with and hearing speech that you agree with and never learning to interact, or even speech that you disagree with, never learning to interact with it in a way that is constructive and can help people challenge themselves, but also like us to build better solutions to things. And the problems that we're gonna be dealing with, like inequity and global warming, are problems that are so diverse and across different ranges and a bunch of different research that it's not gonna be enough for us just to know our own small little fields and to only be able to speak in that language. We're gonna to need to learn how to communicate in such diverse ways. And I see free speech as being the tool for that. I don't see this as pure ideological principle. I do and I don't. And I think that we need to see it as a tool more than this principle that needs to be pure. Yeah, um, okay, I'd also like the chance to redeem my very sleepy Thursday night prank, so thank you guys for waking me up. Um, so, uh, what I was saying in regards to an inherent contradiction in my argument, I think what ties my two viewpoints together is that um, even the act of discussing things like platforming and cancel culture, uh, it's a critical moment in it's a critical moment in our time as, as a college, as an intellectual community, in deciding uh, the direction that we want to go in as a student body, as a community of scholars. While being critical of the Chicago statement, I don't believe that we should be disinviting speakers uh, from the campus. What I do question is, and uh, you put this beautifully, uh, the, the value of inviting individual speakers, um, discussing the educational merits of inviting individual speakers to campus before exhausting avenues of empathetic discourse uh, between students. Uh, in regards to how we would format future talks. I believe you're, you're asking for potential remedies um, to the, what, well, what has been happening on campus. Um, I think it starts in the audience. It starts, it starts before the event starts. Um, the crowd I see in front of me is as ideologically diverse as any room you would find at Williams College. Um, are people gonna talk about this after? How, how are we engaging with the material that we're being presented with? Um, I think, and this is me and Essence, Essence and I were both talking about this earlier, about how um, things can become so socially and politically polarized uh, at the campus in terms of discussing things. Uh, people, people are afraid of sharing what they think um, because of things like cancel culture. Uh, one immediate remedy that I see, and not even in regards to like practical or pragmatic measures um, such as uh, group discussion, but attitude change. Um, not, not being as a, afraid of, of judgment, even though I, it's a ridiculous thing for me to just like say um, or ask you to instill. But I, I don't think that any other measure would prove, or rather any other measure that we instill would prove futile otherwise, um, because we, we wouldn't be talking about anything. So, yeah. Um, can I just point out like, yeah. I feel like we both wrote op-eds about free speech and like people that don't really know either of us that well, or maybe know one of us but not the other, right. would assume that like how could these two people be on a stage together when they wrote two op-eds that are, some people would call opposite. And I think that it kind of just shows like we actually agree in so many ways about the importance of free speech and like how it can be used as a tool. And I think it kind of just goes to show like there's always a commonality somewhere and there's always a point in which we agreed on something and we diverged and that's fine, but like, we can have a respectful conversation about it and it's not a superficial conversation. And I know when we end it, you're not gonna judge me as a human being, but we were discussing an idea and we disagreed and that's okay. I, just um, one idea, the Southern Poverty Law Center put out a guide about a year ago uh, to cam campuses, what to do when you find out that a white supremacist has been invited to your campus or some other hate monger. And this may sound, so, you know, like it's so obvious, but I think a lot of people haven't thought of it, that unfortunately, some student groups that have invited such speakers really are not necessarily aware of the ideas and of how offensive and upsetting and traumatizing the ideas are to some of their classmates. And that publication actually cites examples of where student groups, you know, traditionally marginalized student groups go to the inviter organization and just talk to them person to person. Do you understand what this is? the message that this is sending to me. And that has actually resulted in 
disinvitations by the by the inviting group retracting um, the dis, the invitation and you know putting that aside I think what it shows is we should never give up on anybody never assume that we can't reach them and achieve something positive and it would at least be a way of expressing our dignity to at least try to reach them in that way thank you everybody so at this time, I would like to open for questions. I'm going to take them in groups of three. Yes, sir. It's coming. I've got a microphone for you, sir, if you'd like. Of course. I'd like to make a comment rather than ask a question, if that's OK. Um, I got involved in civil rights in 1962. And sometime around 1964 or 65, the African-American woman who was the boss of the committee I worked in, supervising the work we were doing, said one night in exasperation, you know, the difference between the South and the North is that the Southerners know they're going to have to change simply because if we gain any legal equality, there are so many of us. African Americans are the majority in so many counties down south. But in the north, people don't think they're prejudiced. They don't see it. And they don't think they're going to have to change. I'm with you on one thing. I'm still explaining stuff rather than having my friends of color having to explain stuff. It gets tiresome, but I don't think they should have to do all the explaining. There are people who need to do more listening and more learning on their own. You are in an unusual campus. You know that much better than I do. You know there's this big fractious context around you, but part of your context is that my generation and the generation between mine and yours would not have these conversations, would not sit down, would not take the risk that in speaking with people with whom they differ in one way or another, you name it, and I'm not talking about active haters now, I'm talking about people with whom you have various kinds of differences, because my generation and the generation between mine and yours would not have a conversation, would not risk changing their minds or changing their hearts. You're in this situation now. I ask you to take the risk. Your minds might change and your heart might change or this country will never get out of the rat hole we're in. Thank you, sir. Questions? Hi, thank you guys so much. Um, I, I want to ask about, I'm curious, you've talked a lot about platforms and how, sorry if you can't see me so well, um, platforms and how you know, platforms give power to the speakers that we're inviting or the people that we let use them. I'm curious just more in this conversational setting that's not necessarily one-on-one, -on -one, but maybe Hamza, like in the conversational setting that you described, how, what should we do and how can we address the kind of dynamics that just naturally emerge when people start talking? When you're at lunch and someone starts telling a story and everyone else is listening to them? Like, free speech in that context, although philosophically we can treat it like it's something that everyone individually equally has, in that context it's really not equally distributed because someone's being, you know, someone's listening, someone's talking, and oftentimes that dynamic keeps occurring throughout, you know, all of our everyday situations. And I think that, that might be part of what contributes to campus culture, just the kinds of conversations that happen at Mission. So, curious what your thoughts are. Do you, wait, do you mind making the question just a, a bit more concise? I'm confused as what specifically you're asking. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm just asking about, in that kind of conversational context where right. even a subtle way, if someone is, you know, talking the whole time, you know, or, or just like those situations emerge in a classroom too, where there's a few students who maybe are more articulate or more comfortable talking than others and they get to say more because of that. Is, is that kind of thing okay? Is that sort of precluding the equality that we're trying to strive for? The other thing that I gathered out of what you were saying the first time is also what happens when somebody who 
is more articulate and maybe more verbose says things that other people would like to disagree with. Is that correct? Yeah, that's really Okay. <sighs> yeah, you can, yeah, you can, yeah. Um, I find myself in conversations doing that and because I think it's two things, like people who can quickly respond to things and like you said, are more articulate, often dominate conversations. But I think it's important when having a conversation that every comment that you say, you're supposed to be open to critique and open to people engaging in it. And I think in class you often see people who maybe know more about a subject or like to talk a lot dominate the class conversation. But like for personally for me as a rule, like I only speak if I want people to add ideas to it or I'm still questioning it myself or people can add things to it. And I think that's, in general, when you're having a conversation with someone, it shouldn't just be you sharing your personal take on everything, but more an inviting comment that offers other people in the room to add to it. And also, like, if you're talking a lot, stop talking. <laughs> it's honestly, it's okay. Right, uh, to add on to that, and um, so I think part of that can also just be chalked up to conversation style. In case you guys haven't been able to tell by now, I'm not uh, a public speaking person. <laughs> um, <laughs> But what I'm actually interested in, in regards to your question, although I, it's, it's like a slight left turn. Um, wow, that happened again. <laughs> we just can't handle your greatness right now. You're sparing us. Yeah. You were in the tutorial at 8.30 this morning. Yes, I, I was. Okay, um, anyway. <laughs> so you're talking, yeah, oh yes, okay, I remember now, my apologies. Okay, so you're, t you're talking about um, someone someone telling uh, a story and taking up too much space in a conversation. What actually is interesting is how conversation stops because that's something that I've talked a lot about with my friends on campus. Um, it's, not, it's not just whether or not people are getting a fair share in conversation because at the end of the day, all, like take space, make space is really all you can do about it. Um, what actually happens is the way conversation progresses on campus. When people talk about like hot button issues or I don't want to say hot button issues because people are willing to have academic conversations here but when people are talking about um, uncomfortable issues, like, like issues that cause intellectual and emotional discomfort. Uh, someone complaining about a microaggression. Um, I, it's happened to me personally, it's happened to a lot of people that I know anecdotally. Conversation ceases. People don't want to discuss it. Um, unless it's, it's for the purpose of fishing out some educational tidbit to then carry on. It's not, it's not actual conversation. Um, I, yeah, I, I guess it would be fishing, fishing for information, um, fishing for knowledge. And so in, as opposed to the problem, I think, although of course it does happen, it happens very often um, in Williams classrooms where uh, three people take over the conversation. It's, I would argue that everyone, um, everyone in the class has things to share of value and that people should be more aware of it. But the more interesting part of your question is what are you doing to uh, skate over the silences? Like are you, are you actually responding to everything that is going on in the conversation? Or are you skirting around the things that are scary to talk about? Yeah, that doesn't really answer your question. I guess I've, I've just asked you to think about something else. Yeah. There, there are actually experts that work on this and organizations that are forming on campuses and in communities around the country specifically to help people and facilitate dialogue. We, um, we use an exercise in our committee uh, all but two people participated, um, not because they didn't, they just couldn't make it. We did it in one of the dance studios and one of our students ran it and uh, he was the one who, it's a, called a spectrum exercise. Some of you may have seen it online. Um, there's one on, um, you know, over uh, Trump support or something like that. But what we did is we, we generated a series of questions that uh, seemed like they would help us understand where we were all, where we all stood with respect to certain questions that we were engaging. And there were uh, one, two, three, there were probably like six or seven lines and we all stood in the center and then to, the, uh, to one side it was uh, slightly agree, you know, str um, agree more and strongly agree and then the opposite on the other side. So the question would be asked, and we would all step where we were on that. And then not everyone had to speak, nobody had to speak, but we would often 
say why we were there. And one of the things that was really interesting is what happened as a result of that is, especially when there was some polarization, there were strong disagreements and strong agreements, it turned out that it, it had to do with the way the question was asked and so how they interpreted the question and they weren't comfortable answering one way because they didn't necessarily, they weren't sure uh, that it didn't mean something that they would strongly disagree with. And so when that became clear, we were able to talk about the ways in which we actually didn't, it was clear we didn't disagree that much in the end. So there can be misunderstanding, there can be misreading, there can be, language can fail us. Um, there's a lot of reasons why we may make assumptions about what somebody's thinking. Um, and uh, it's really, I think it's really important to get to the bottom of it. And this exercise actually allowed us to understand our range of views but also the reasons, which then enabled each of us to connect in some way, often, with somebody who might have disagreed very strongly with the position that we took. And it was, uh, it was incredibly, I mean, I was not looking forward to it, I can tell you that, but it was very powerful. It really was. Well, thank you. Do we have, oh man, you, sir, and then behind him. I'm, I was a philosophy major, and I don't know this, you know this year's curriculum well enough to know whether this is available as a course, but you would think that instead of the, you know, the, the college Republicans inviting some Fox, you know, Fox personality onto campus, that you know, the Democratic Union on campus would want to invite you know, Laura Ingram or you know, whoever it might be onto campus so they can take them apart logically, you know, in the question and answer or in the format, you know, that they set up and, you know, and have that go viral on YouTube and, you know, win all sorts of kudos and whatever, you know, uh, reputation, you know, benefit that might give you because the speech that you hate um, almost always is bad speech, it's bad logic, it's bad arguments. You were referring, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. You were referring to, you know, the logical fallacies that, you know, I mean, the only way to not believe in global warming, the only way to deny the Holocaust, the only way to believe that one skin color makes you smarter than another skin color, the only way to do that is to dramatically abuse the rules of evidence and dramatically abuse the rules of logic and doesn't the world deserve this to be called out? And if Williams College can't do it, who can? Thank you. Would you mind passing it directly behind you, sir? Hello. Um, so I was also going to maybe touch on the importance of ownage of people that you disagree with and why they're bad and wrong. Um, but I was also going to ask kind of um, essence, you said earlier that I actually wrote down because it was so well said. Um, make, sure that, you make sure you speak into the... Yeah, sorry, yeah. that everyone who leaves here has a responsibility to be a change maker, and I thought that was, like, really beautiful. And um, I was wondering, like, kind of what you think the institution ought to do, all of, all, what all of you think, obviously, uh, not just essence, what the institution ought to do to encourage people to uh, empathetically disagree with people and to, uh, when necessary, really like take them down and destroy their argument, like, and whether you think that um, censorship of certain kinds like enhances that or not, because like, yeah. I'm just wondering like what you think the institution like ought to do to encourage that. Okay, so to make sure that I'm understanding correctly, you want to know what the institution should do in order to support change makers and students who want to be change makers in their communities after they graduate and here yeah. in encouraging them to empathetically disagree and engage. And I didn't quite catch what you had said about censorship. Just like how, if you think that um, certain speech should be censored, how you think that that kind of squares with the ability to make a coherent argument against certain types of beliefs that are, in a lot of cases, probably abhorrent, but like in the outside world you will encounter. 
so equipping change makers with the tools they need to survive and create change and engage with ideas they disagree with yeah. outside of campus. Yeah. Well, I mean, one thing that I would say is I think that there are things that can be done in classrooms that can, um, uh, I'm not sure about the change maker um, um, project and how that can be fostered, but in, in a classroom. I think students can do things outside of class, and I think there are ways and, and this, and, you know, ideas about empathetic learning, um, understanding, and how to, how to enhance understanding. There are even, there are a lot of places that are doing, we had at Williams and among staff uh, over a decade ago, an effort to really enhance a kind of sense of connection and solidarity among staff um, that had to do with learning how to um, figure out where they stood in relationship to other individuals on campus in, their, in the hierarchy at Williams, what it felt like. They were sharing their experiences, but they did it in a structured way. There are a lot of ways to do that. But in the classroom, first of all, I, I just want to say, I think that argument is important. I'm a philosopher, but um, I think sometimes the point of a conversation isn't to win an argument. Um, and I think that, that maybe before, I mean, in a, in a, in a, in a, you know, you want to engage, you want to understand what somebody's argument is. You want to understand what their assumptions are. Uh, and uh, there are certain kinds of debates where people are starting from very different basic assumptions and values, actually, in a pluralist society. So then those are difficult things to win arguments about. But what you can do is maybe enhance your understanding of where the person is coming from, which at least leads to your not vilifying them and not disrespecting them and potentially agreeing to disagree. Sometimes you can change their mind, but sometimes you can't, or they might change yours. But you might also come to see them slightly differently. You may have a shared experience, like both of your mothers had breast cancer. You know, if you get yourself in a position where you actually learn that this is another human being over here who has feelings and experiences, and they're not all connected to the point of the, the, the argument they're making right now. Um, but they may be somewhat related, and even understanding that can be helpful. So I think understanding is a really important prerequisite to um, the kind of social reasoning we need to do in a, collect, in a, in a democratic society. Um, we can't all do it with everyone, but when we have to debate and discuss and get something done together, whether it's learning or, you know, in another setting, getting, you know, a political project, we have to um, have a basic respect for one another, and that comes often from some kind of understanding. Um, I also think that the benefit of going to a liberal arts college like Williams is that you have the opportunity to learn a lot of different disciplines and ways of thinking, but even more than that, it just sounds weird because I'm a big fan of political theory, but I, the classes that I value the most are the ones that take theory or take ideas that you learn in class and somehow apply them to real world problems or even the club, clubs that people do after or not in school and taking the skills that you learn in those classrooms and like applying them to the things that you like to do outside of the classroom. And for me, I think that, and I don't know if in the classroom this always happens that people they're just learning, but not necessarily learning the tools to apply them to other things. And I think it's important that when we're taking a class or like having a conversation or like doing an activity that we like learn or we realize the skill that we're gaining from doing those things and trying to apply them to other activities that we do. And kind of just like, I see colleges like this four years of just learning and trying different things and realizing things that you're bad at and just going from there. Yeah, um, I, I have two remarks that I hope can prove at least insightful. Um, uh, regarding the first question, I think what comes to mind for me is whether or not um, students have a responsibility to intellectual evangelism um, in terms of calling out that bad logic, uh, particularly in, in inviting, inviting those speakers with bad logic to campus uh, at the expense of the baseline comfort of marginalized students. Um, it's, in that, I think that the heart is in the right place, but I would question um, the motivation behind pursuing that particular line of argument. I personally would love to get into debates with those kind of people. Um, it's not, I don't think it's anyone's individual place to make that decision for anyone else. And of course, um, it could come down to just like not coming to the talk, uh, but I suppose that would be up to individual discretion. 
Uh, regarding the second point about institutional responsibility uh, to solve these kinds of problems, um, I think Professor Sawicki hit it on the nose. Um, so again, what occurs to me is that people are individual actors. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that the institution can do much. Uh, we attempt to with things like the Chicago Statement. Um, but in terms of understanding one another personally, I think there is a lot to be said in terms of the work that we each put in to, to fit into a particular space. Uh, two immediate personal examples that come to mind is when I first got to college as a freshman, uh, my use of slang was so heavy that people didn't understand what I was saying the first time around ever. I constantly had to repeat myself. Um, uh, second example is my, my name isn't Hamza. Um, it, it's Hamza. Uh, but I just don't like people calling me Hamza, so I just I let it go. Uh, I think that there's... Understanding that people become flexible and may do so unwittingly in trying to fit in, or rather trying to blend in to um, an ideologically diverse intellectual community and what that means in terms of discourse uh, between individual actors. Uh, knowing that someone is coming from a, another perspective without malice for your well-being, uh, it's, it's a prerequisite for um, engaging conversation. I actually have a follow-up question for you. When you're surrounded by people who are trying to fit in and blend in, I mean, I came here after eight gap years, so I have had to do my fair share of trying to blend in. Um, but there is, seems to be some difficulty with ourselves, and I see this in us specifically. We'll use the example of our academics. It's very hard for people that I know and for myself to cut ourselves any slack when we make an academic mistake. It was like, oh, I, I resubmitted a final paper twice because I like, screwed up the citations both times, and I was just terrified that it was wrong. They were both right. It was fine. But there was no space for me to give myself any slack and to give, forgive myself for a mistake. And the problem I see is when that gets applied to other people, and we forget that ourselves change, and then we forget that other people change. So how do we navigate being growing, changing individuals who are also not necessarily comfortable all the time and are adapting ourselves. Like, what, what kind of empathy do you see as necessary to be able to be able to let yourself grow and then trust that other people are growing too? Right. Uh, I think, so there are two important distinctions to that question. Uh, the first is um, one of the main debates about cancel culture, actually, which is uh, the, the ignoring of temporality as, as a quality of... Um, whatever instance occurs that comes under the scope of cancel culture, understanding that people can grow and learn from mistakes, um, and that those mistakes were not necessarily made with malicious intent um, from the transgressor. The other thing that occurs to me is... I'm proud of you. No, I think I'll sit on it and come back in like two minutes, yeah. Yeah. Do any of you have something? On that one? Well, I think on that point, it's so wonderful that something that civil libertarians have been crusading for, but like a voice in the wilderness for decades, has recently taken hold, and that's this movement toward restorative justice that we're seeing support from across the ideological spectrum, uh, where there is an attempt to recognize uh, redemption and rehabilitation and restoration, not only for the person who's committed the infraction, but that it's actually better for the victim as well, uh, even when people have committed violent crimes. So it seems to me if we're willing to use that forgiving, restorative approach for physical violence, we should be willing to do it for somebody who's committed a thought crime or a speech crime, and I use those terms somewhat ironically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and thank you for jogging my memory at the second point on the topic of restoration. Um, Robin, Robin DeAngelo is uh, a fairly prominent um, scholar on critical race theory and education. And what she talks about, she recently published a book, actually, um, on white fragility. Uh, and she purposely uses this title that like invokes fear in those occupying dominant positionalities in the room. Uh, but she attempts to demystify it by clarifying it as a defensive mechanism to uh, protect oneself from enduring discomfort. So in terms of um, not being very forgiving of people's ignorance when, when they first get to college, uh, I remember, so I actually attended a Princeton conference uh, for first generation Ivy students. Um, and there was a kid from Boston College who was a senior and had never come into contact with pronouns before. And he was very open about it and knew that he was probably gonna make mistakes for it, apologized for it from the get-go 
and did his best to learn as he went along. Um, it, it's an interesting relationship between the, the transgressor and whoever becomes offended because Again, at the end of the day, yeah, you just have to keep in mind that it's, there's likely not to be malice intent. The fear that people fear, uh, feel at Williams College um, largely stems from social ostracization for, for not, not knowing, not, not being completely up to terms with the way our culture has evolved in the last 5, 10, 20 years, not knowing to put a capital B in front of the letter black, uh, in front of the word black. Um, there's, there's not much more to be said besides being more understanding of, of the person sitting across from you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. So I want to recognize we are at time. If we would like to take one more question, and otherwise, if you need to run out, oh, Charlotte. Um, I think that um, everything you guys have said has been super interesting. Um, in terms of like getting together, understanding each other, having these questions, I think that's like a beautiful you know, great thing to strive for. But I also think it's really important to like think about the meantime, it's a little bit idealistic. Um, and so my question is. Particularly in terms of inviting controversial speakers to campus, how can we address and like help? I think the emotional turmoil that might come with that, for like for people of color or for groups that feel targeted, how can we address that? This like that just inviting these speakers to campus might cause um, a lot of emotional discomfort. And then how can we like acknowledge that and help? I don't know. Because I do. So to make sure that I'm interpreting you correctly again, it's that we're bringing people to campus for the sake of this debate. How do we make sure that we're taking care of our community and that what we're doing isn't causing undue harm so that it would cause somebody to not feel like they belonged or to feel like they aren't welcome here or that they're being made to see that someone's going to call them subhuman? Actually, I'm looking at a distinguished psychologist in the front row here. Um, one of the things that I learned, not being an expert in that field, that I found so inspiring is that um, psychologists and mental health experts and counselors are, are absolutely convinced that we can teach everybody and train everybody with habits of resiliency. And I find it very hard to say this without, I really have to stress, this is not blaming the victim or putting the responsibility on the victim, but making clear that people don't have to be victimized by those who are trying to disparage or dehumanize them. We can, and I personally have some experience with this, uh, we can learn to rise above that and actually look down on them, not seed to them that power over us. And I'm really convinced that this is something and should be done proactively for all of us because we are inevitably going to, especially beyond the wonderful precincts of a campus like Williams, we are going to be encountering very tra potentially traumatizing ideas and expressions and we have to learn how not to let it, uh, them get us down. Uh, I, can I just say, I've, I've told the story before, but I'm, I, I'm sure some of you have heard Greta Thun Thunberg this, this week, right? There's been a lot of media attention to her uh, climate activism. Uh, she's a person with Asperger's, but I was telling the story, and I can't resist telling it one more time, because if you haven't seen it, she's been trolled ever since she got to the U.S. online. Um, she's just been torn apart. You know, she's got certain facial expressions and she never smiles and she doesn't really care about her appearance all that much. She's got high fun she's high functioning autism. Uh, she's also incredibly smart about a lot of things. And um, when she was asked by an interviewer why she, um, what she thought about all that trolling, she said, well, you know, I think it's kind of funny. But then she said, but it's also kind of like, if I saw fire out there, and it was raging, and it was heading toward us, and instead of doing something about it, you looked at me and said, why are you wearing that outfit? And I just thought, that is so powerful, right? And that's the resilience. Now, she may just be a little bit immune to what other people say and think, but she, it's a kind of power. You know, I just, not, I mean, she's not a person of color, but she is on the spectrum. You know, and she deals with this. 
um, all the time. And she's very, very fierce. It's an incredibly, um, it was impressive, really impressive. Um, she's, a, she's an interesting character. So anyway, I guess that's about resilience. Yeah, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, so to very quickly take um, actually a more sociological approach to it and take attention away from the resilience of the individual actor who is suffering trauma. Um, what I would ask are the social conditions created by the people around them um, to exacerbate that trauma. An example that I'd use, uh, last year there was a march um, in remembrance of the two professors that left. Um, and what occurred to me uh, while attending the march, which was, it was an incredibly heartfelt demonstration, were uh, a collection of people, the, uh, it was, we had congregated in Baxter and there were a lot of people um, sitting uh, in, in Wheats and in uh, Whitman's, the Whitman's tabling area, uh, minding their own business, uh, like not even looking up as people were chanting. Um, and what just occurred to me was like, how, how could you not even turn your head, right? Like how could you not look over your shoulder? I think people inevitably are, are going to have to suffer uh, traumas here and it should be a goal of an individual actor and of an institution hopefully uh, to, to lessen that trauma as much as possible. But, to actually do that, it's, it's not institutional policy. It's, um, it's cognizance on, on the individual level. Of, it's, it's, it's a lax bro turning around and wondering what's going on. Um, why, why are all those people yelling? Yeah. And uh, not really adding to that, but being really intentional about when a speaker comes, and it's not just this thing that you do, but recognizing that there has to be a community in place before that speaker comes to know so there's emotional support for people, but also so there's just support in numbers and the ability to be able to talk about those concepts with people. And it's not even just speakers, but I think it's important that the stuff that we learn about in our classes, which is a lot and a lot of information, like do you have people to talk about it with and decompress that information with? Because it's so much and I think we get lost in like having to turn in papers and like have conversations and like being in Presky all night and all this stuff and it's taking a second just to reflect upon all of the information that we have and that speaker and what they're going to talk about and just take a minute to think about it and to talk about it with someone and without any intentions of who's right or wrong but just talking about it and just taking a minute. Awesome. Thank you everybody so incredibly much. Thank you for coming out. It's been an honor and a delight.